we'll just let people come in as they come in. Uh, we're live streaming this in a minute, or good to go. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for coming, to participating in this Democratic primary Secretary of State forum this evening at the Rochambeau Library. Um, I'm not going to speak long, but I do want to say the following, and forgive me. You know, on the outside of this library is a large medallion that says Enlightenment. And our candidates here have names that mean both love and beauty. So in the spirit of love, beauty, and enlightenment, I'd like to begin. Thank you. Um, our candidates are Representative Greg Moray and Stephanie Bute Beauty. Stephanie Beauty. They will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, for the rules, we flip the coin at the beginning to determine who goes first here. It'll be Stephanie. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds. We have a timekeeper up front with yellow and red cards. The yellow card will go up at 15 seconds. When you have 15 seconds to go, red card would stop at that point. They know to kind of wrap things up. I don't think I'm going to have to be too tough to anybody. Um, if the candidate mentions another candidate within, like, you know, some kind of, like, lie, little dig or something, that candidate will be given a chance to respond, 30 seconds to respond. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much right. No crosstalk. This is going to be a really polite Form, right? I think we're really trying to get to issues. And so all my questions are based on the duties and responsibilities of the Secretary of State and how they plan to execute the office where they to be elected. Um, so without any further ado, let me preamble this with the mission of the Rhode Island Department of State is to engage and empower all Rhode Islanders by making government more accessible and transparent, encouraging civic pride, enhancing commerce, and ensuring that elections are fair, fast, and accurate. So in your opening statement, starting with Stephanie, please explain who you are and give a general overview of your experience and philosophy of government and public service. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here in the Rochambeau Library for hosting. Um, authentic civic engagement is described as one that denotes a shared value in the interest of the community and the desire to improve that community's needs. My name is Stephanie Beauty. I'm a senior IT professional. I work for a software company in Boston, and before that, I worked for GE for a number of years. In my time while at GE, I worked to manage the cyber risk management team, work on the divestiture, which is just a fan of saying that we were spinning off businesses, and I had a team of seven where we brought in $25 billion of revenue in a quarter. On top of that, I own the GE at Work mobile app and the GE intranet for 250,000 GE employees globally. My experience makes me uniquely qualified for this role, primarily because Secretary of State should be a very neutral party, someone whose sole interest is into making sure that elections are fair, secure, and accurate. We do not need the, need the ongoing debate of polarization between both parties. And so having a fresh perspective, someone who's going to use IT to influence and improve our systems is dramatically needed in this modern day and age. And so I want to share and improve the systems that we currently have in order to build upon the infrastructure to take this into a modern space. Thank you. I want to make a note here. Um, when you're taking, speaking to the mic, you can be far away. You have about eight inches to a foot. You don't have to be right on top of it, so everybody can relax a little bit. All good. I should have said that at the beginning of the um, Representative Amore. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to Uprise for hosting this uh, event tonight and for the Rochambeau Library. Probably should have mentioned uh, that. For the, for the venue. As someone that's been campaigning for this office for 13 months, uh, largely on a platform of civic engagement, I'm thrilled to be here uh, in this setting and, and frankly disappointed that more of the media outlets have not uh, offered us an opportunity for a forum like this and have not offered all of the candidates for the CD2 or the governor's race uh, a forum. I think that's that's not good for uh, democracy. Uh, with that said, I I'm Greg Amore. I'm a state representative from East Providence. For 26 years, I taught civics and government at East Providence High School, where I also coached hockey and baseball. For the past six years, I've been the athletic administrator at East Providence. Uh, a, a big job, $600,000 budget, 72 employees, um, uh, uh, human resources. Um, and, and most importantly, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself personally. My wife is here. She's my high school sweetheart. Uh, we are both uh, educated in the East Providence school system. 
has our, our two daughters, Tess, a graduate of American University, and Meg, a junior at Manhattan College. My mom uh, was a school secretary. My dad was a maintenance man for Narragansett Electric. I'm the first person in my family to attend and graduate uh, college. Um, and both my parents instilled in me a deep, deep love for public service because they, they told me it was important to serve your community. So prior to being an elected official, uh, aside from the volunteerism I did in East Providence, in 2012, I ran for office as a, a member of the, uh, for the General Assembly. I was elected and I've been honored to serve the people of East Providence for 10 years in that capacity. Thank you. Um, following up, um, and this will go to Representative Amore, it's a very simple one. Why do you want to be Rhode Island's next Secretary of State? I think I have a unique skill set that combines my professional experience as a civics and government teacher, and much of the office is dedicated to civic engagement. Uh, my professional experience in managing a large system, the East Providence, East Providence School Department's athletic system, which is a K through eight system plus Special Olympics. Um, and then my experience in government, uh, 10 years in the General Assembly, chair of the House Finance Subcommittee on Education, chair of the Small Business uh, Committee, uh, vice chair of the Education Committee. I've sponsored and advocated for uh, legislation that's directly tied to this office, including being the first co-sponsor of the Let Rhode Island Vote Act, where I whipped that on the, in, the, uh, in the General Assembly. I managed a piece of it on the floor. I've also authored and co-sponsored the uh, Civic Literacy Act, which mandates that every Rhode Island high school student take at least one semester of civics before they graduate and prove proficiency with a project-based requirement. Uh, along with that, I, when I served as the chairman of the Small Business Committee during the pandemic, I was able to meet so many small business owners and I was able to listen to their concerns. I was the co-author of the uh, Small De Business Development Fund, which helped businesses get capital that they couldn't otherwise get through traditional avenues. Uh, I worked very closely and helped finance the Small Business Development Center at URI, uh, where we uh, work with businesses, startups, and we help businesses uh, to continue uh, to prosper. So I think I'm uniquely qualified with, with that combination of experiences. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Beauty, Ms. Beauty, if you. So why I wanna be secretary? I think that that's an awesome question. My background, uh, working as a teacher's assistant with Jump Car Jumpstart, being an AmeriCorps member, working after I graduated as a social worker, working for folks with developmental disabilities and advocating for their rights, and seeing how hard it is to kind of make sure that they have fund funding and budgeting to be able to meet their daily necessities. Uh, then I decided to pursue IT to bring in more within my knowledge space and how I can kind of improve. And one of the things that I saw is processes slows down the way that day-to-day -day people interact, and that's for big companies that have worked at GE, which I've advocated to remove a lot of these processes that would slow down traffic, and then for smaller businesses, which is where I currently work at now. And so what I see in this space is that we need to have someone that has a fresh take on how we can improve our system. For example, when we talk about folks who have been in politics for X amount of years, one of the things that we continuously hear year after year is that certain communities have longer polling lines than others. And for folks who are outside of those communities, they don't believe that to be true. What if we use technology in this space to kind of be able to give you a prompt to say that there is a shorter, uh, there's a shorter waiting line to go to your local polling station? That way you could be able to cast your vote. I think that that would remove a lot of the polarization regardless of what part, party you politically affiliate with. Another thing is one of the reasons that I'm also running is the frustration that it took for me that when I lived in Newport and I moved to Bristol, trying to find my polling station and that had changed. What if we actually gave text message notifications and informed people? So I think that these are common sense solutions that politicians don't seem to care about, but the wheel just keeps turning and here we are. Thank you, thank you. Um, this will be with you, Ms. Beatty. Um, the, the Secretary of State registers voters there's ballots, certifies election results, and administers oaths of office. What is, and this question came from a reader, by the way, so it, um, at least a phrasing. What is your boldest vision for free, fair election reform, and what technologies, innovations, and or systems would you like to implement? So as you can hear of my eccentric for using modern day technology, uh, to be as fair, fast, and accurate are the three pillars that I'm running my campaign on. Fair, meaning that everyone, everyone 
And that means folks who are homeless, that means folks who are well off, has the right and opportunity to exercise their inherent right to vote. Fast making sure that when we provide results that we're using modern day technologies. We're not doing enough to make sure that we are monitoring the tools and we're updating our software systems. People are complaining about when they go to cast their vote and that the system doesn't necessarily work as accurately or as accurately as it should have. Folks who are poll workers complain of the frustration of information of people who believe that they're supposed to be at a site, that they're not supposed to be there. And so we need to use our modern day IT infrastructure to be able uh, to expedite this process. It should be something so seamlessly, so effective, and why are we not thinking of those spaces? Um, how do we make sure that our results are accurate? One of those things is cyber risk management, cyber, uh, cyber security. What are we doing in those spaces? What are we doing to make sure that people trust the results that they're given, right? So when we look at politics nowadays, there's a lot of misinformation. How do we make sure that our government is transparent? And that is something that I want to do. I want to be able to provide, which is what we do in tech all of the time, that whenever we do a release update and there's a bug fix, we literally list out the things that we're fixing, the updates that we're making, and we're informing the public that we are doing our due diligence in that space. Thank you. Uh, Representative Amari, same question. Thank you. Rhode Island is actually rated very high uh, for our election process, and, and it's rated very accurately, and it has become a better system over the last eight years under Secretary Gorbea. Specifically, uh, we need to implement the, um, the piece of the Let Rhode Island Vote Act that has not been implemented, which is being able to apply for a ballot uh, uh, application online. We need to safely imp implement the electronic voting option for uh, those that are severely disabled that the General Assembly passed and that many other states have passed. That has to be done so that we can give everybody the access they need to vote. Um, I'm an advocate for same-day registration. Uh, as, as well as a permanent ballot list. Uh, it exists in many states already. There is no evidence of fraud in any way or chaos in any way associated with those two initiatives. I would really uh, like to, and I think uh, Stephanie can agree with me on this, I'd like to use our voter registration system so that registered voters can indicate on a nomination paper electronically who they're signing for. Uh, because it's an arduous process to get those signatures, and we should make that as open and as uh, technologically feasible as possible. I'm proud to have co-sponsored and voted uh, for early voting, um, which does address those long lines that we that we saw at at, uh, at certain points and during certain elections. Uh, we we should do everything we can to make the process as smooth and as simple as possible. The Let Rhode Island Vote Act does that in many ways, including a no excuse mail ballot. Thank you. Name in my um, Oh, you just said that you might agree to think that was. So um, right. I think that there are some places that we have some similarities, but to be quite honest, even with the, um, the, the ability for folks to folks who are developmentally disabled to vote, that is one of the ways that the Let RI Vote Act is very exclusive. So while on the campaign trail, I've been able to talk to folks especially since it was within my field of social working, where someone who is blind or visually impaired. Currently, the mail ballot itself literally separates them from having the right to participate in the way that they would like to do so. And so being able to cast ballots in person and using technology in that space seems to be a very common sense approach. And you've been in this space uh, as a politician for a number of years in the General Assembly, and I would like to understand why in your tenure this hasn't been done now, but now you're passing this type of stuff. Now, you're, now that you have been campaigning for the last 13 months is when the Let RI Vote Act now come into play. So is Sorry. that politics or is that actually like public service? Are we asking questions? Of each other? I wasn't, I figure we can so, have one response. So more. first, I, I think, you know, uh, politics in, in my view is honorable. It's, it's public service. I don't use the word as a pejorative. Um, I, think it's, I think it's something that you do to serve uh, your, your community. Um, I have been the sponsor and co-sponsor of a number of initiatives to uh, open up voting access. And the Let Rhode Island Vote Act passed this year, but it was in the works for many years. And I was a sponsor of that bill as it first appeared. I was a sponsor of the original early voting bill. Uh, so this is not new. And, and the other uh, bill that we were talking about passed this year, but I was a co-sponsor of that bill in prior years as well, about those who are disabled uh, having access to their own equipment to vote, uh, uh, vote a ballot comfortably, or they can use the new machinery, which as a member of the House Finance Committee, I supported the allocation for, 
uh, for disabled voters. Thank you. Um, question number four. What reforms to the way, now this is, this question is a preamble, um, is about what kind of things you'd advocate, not stuff you might necessarily have the power to do as the Secretary of State, but using the soft power of um, testifying and talking to legislators. What reforms to the way Rhode Island conducts its elections would you support as Secretary of State? For example, I'm thinking about things like ranked choice voting, publicly funded elections, removal of the asterisks in the top slot on the ballot for endorsed candidates in primaries, or any other ideas you might have. Sure. Um, in 2014, I co-sponsored the elimination of the master lever. Uh, so that's, that's an example of what your question uh, speaks to. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm open to eliminating the asterisk. I'm, I'm not sure if the asterisk helps or hurts. Uh, when I was uh, elected in 2012, I was not the endorsed candidate. Uh, I was uh, running against the leadership, um, and I ended up winning that election. And as you know, there are many, many people who win elections. But I'd be open to a, a system where there's a lottery like, like we have now uh, based on Republican or Democrat, uh, and that lottery determines um, placement. Um, uh, I, I think... I think what I talked about in the last question is, is really something that, that we can focus on, and that's making the nomination process um, much easier uh, through that connective, that connective uh, voter system and nomination system. I think that's a, a really uh, good way to, um, to do that. The other thing we can do, and when you talk about ranked choice voting, the Secretary of State's office is in a, a bully pulpit position where we can bring in people in a working group who are experts in these fields, we can bring people in from out of state and, and be informed by the experiences of, let's say, New York in ranked cho choice voting or Alaska in ranked choice voting, open primaries. These are things we should consider. And since there is uh, currently uh, pilot, pilot elections and permanent elections in this space, we can learn a lot from that, bring people together, write a report, make a recommendation to the General Assembly who really has the power to implement these. Right on time. I, I thought it was interesting that you didn't mention that you were in support of public funding for running for office. Oh, I that, so what that pretty much is, is using taxpayer money to apply for a job. I've never heard of using someone else's money to fund my job application. And then if I don't win, what happens there? Do I get to reimburse the taxpayers for wasting their money because I didn't win? Um, these are some of the things that I think that are one that profit and benefit a group where it marginalizes others. And another concern there is the fact that this type of endorsement of using tax paying money for funding public uh, offices like myself, right? If you're running for governor, you probably need a couple million dollars for that. I can see that there's so many other school districts that can benefit from that. Uh, if you're running for Secretary of State, you know, based on how much you raise, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars for that as well. I can see that that money could be repurposed towards early childhood education, um, things of that nature. I also agree that removing the asterisk is one of those ways that doesn't allow the public to be informed. You just see an asterisk sign and you just think that, okay, uh, this is probably the best choice, uh, but not necessarily so. And so the discourse, the, the conversation that we're having here, allowing for mass information, mass information in the sense of that the press would be able to allow folks to be able to make informed decisions rather than using uh, the run for public office as just another campaign ad um, and just paid advertising strategy on name recognition, on brand recognition, rather than being able to make intellectual and informed decisions. Okay, thank you. Let's stop cutting off. Let's go. Mm -hmm. um, next time we'll, we'll get back to public finance and assuming um, I don't know if I have what we can talk about before then. Okay. We'll, we'll see. Um, so uh, the next two questions are about business incorporation and services. I'm sure we'll squeeze that in somehow. Here we go. The Secretary of State works with companies registered to do business in Rhode Island, more than 70,000 in all. How can the Secretary of State, the question is, and it goes to Ms. Beauty, how can the Secretary of State do better, not only for large corporations, but for small and even micro businesses, as well as worker cooperatives? So this one is a matter that's very deep and close to my heart. My mom, uh, my grandmother was the oldest of 10. She raised her family. Uh, she had five children. She raised them off of small businesses. Uh, there are three key, three key issues uh, with uh, this here. And so that's the DPR, the Department of Business Regulation. 
a division of taxation in the Department of State. They don't currently speak to each other. From an IT perspective, everyone is using a different system. And if you live in a different city or a different town when you go to file for your small business, that itself is another arduous process. And so within my role currently as an integrations uh, senior PM, one of my key functions is how do I make uh, old technologies use modern technology and speak to each other. As someone who owns a small business, if you go to open up uh, something right now at the Secretary of State's office, the Division of Taxation does not have to inform you that you have to pay your taxes. You find out the hard way. That is a crutch for a lot of folks, and it is hitting small businesses hard. Rhode Island's economy is based on the backbone of small businesses, and I believe that strongly. And we should be doing more so to help and remove these barriers in order for small businesses to thrive. If you look at Massachusetts, our neighbor, a lot of smaller companies, startups, are thriving there. Why? Because that process is simple. It's straightforward. It's not a lot of regulation with paperwork and bureaucracy. It's really meant to boost the small businesses and encourage and foster economic growth. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so I, I would agree that streamlining the process and the connectivity uh, between the government agencies is incredibly important. And I think the office should serve as a bridge to do just that, uh, both technologically and in person. Uh, I was having a conversation before we started the, the forum about the staff at the Department of State, and I can attest to this, that it's a professional staff uh, that is very, very responsive. When I was the chair of the Small Business Committee in the House, uh, during the pandemic, we heard from many, many businesses who talked about how the office, uh, the Department of State was extremely responsive, more responsive than most other offices. So I would agree there has to be a connectivity. I also think that there should be a working group, a quarterly working group of business owners in the state, uh, including uh, MBEs and WBEs who get together and advise the office on what makes things easier for them. I was supportive of legislation over the past two years that has not passed, uh, that, that does just that, uh, the act fast aspect of, of the office. Um, one of the things that I bring to this office is an interaction with all of these government agencies, with all three branches of government, and with every government, government agency that exists, and personal relationships and knowledge uh, of how to interact with those agencies. And I think that will serve me well if I'm fortunate enough to be elected. Thank you. Um, who else got close? You're, you're next, right? Yes, Tom. Oh. So I... No. 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 So I need a question. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured this would happen. This, this question overlaps a little bit. That's probably why I'm confused, but we'll go for it anyway. Um, Representative Lori, every election cycle, candidates talk about what they call concierge services for those wanting to establish a business or for businesses with questions about navigating the rules and regulations and taxes. What does this look like? And since it will require as you mentioned, multiple state offices work together. How do we make this unkept promise a reality? Here we go. So I think the last question uh, touched on a yeah. lot of that, but I'll go beyond that. Um, currently and, and recently, the Secretary of State's office has developed virtual workshops uh, and, and prior to the pandemic, in-person workshops with uh, business professionals, with professionals in the office, and with uh, outside organizations. And they have uh, worked extremely well to inform uh, people who are starting up or people who are trying to expand business, people who are in a new space, nonprofits, whatever it may be. And this is a this is a, a, a model that I know we can expand, that we can do well, and that we can reach out to the nonprofit sector. We can reach out to uh, every aspect of the business sector. We can reach out to the professionals and those who have uh, started businesses and have uh, retired and come in to, to advise and work on those workshops to give the information that's so valuable to all of the all of the people, the entrepreneurs in the state who are trying to start a business and trying to make that business work. So beyond what I said in the previous question, which I think addresses the specific, uh, specific part of that question, I think these virtual workshops and hopefully in-person workshops with these professionals and people who are experienced in the area uh, would do well to uh, promote small businesses around all businesses. I think those items don't necessarily work. If they did work, what I would not necessarily be right was the lowest in the state. It's done so consistently for the past two decades. Um, where we need to be is really talking to folks who own small businesses and not really getting more corporations and advisees and advisories. I think it's a waste of the taxpayer money. 
Uh, the best way to hear a complaint is to get a suggestion box and actually read those suggestion boxes, right? So when you stay in line, uh, when you have um, feedback from folks that are, and, and I agree that the Department of State has great professional folks, but when it comes to uh, folks in Newport who have opened their businesses and it has taken them at least two months, was my understanding from a constituent, that had to, after speaking to me, call one of their state reps in order to be able to register their business because they were technically operating illegally, even though they were open for 24 years. I think that that is part of the root process here, that people need to jump through hoops in order to be able to open a small business. So how do you remove these blockers? Let's remove all of the nonsense and the red tape. Let's stop adding more problems and saying that we're fixing it. We're really not fixing it. We're just creating more busy work. We're really burning out money. That is one of the reasons why me, as a civilian, am literally looking at leaving my career profession, my profession in IT, to walk into the space of public service because it is a waste. It is truly a waste. You're, we, are we are continuously hearing every election cycle, every politician come up with these fancy ideas, and they go nowhere. This is where change happens. Change happens from real people who've experienced these problems, who actually care, and who want to remove these blockers. Not by calling in our friends that we know at the Department of such and such. They should have fixed it five years ago. They should have fixed it a week ago. Now is not the time to say that we're going to fix it now. A little too late. Thank you. As, as a real person, uh, I, I think I'll respond. Um, I, I think if we look at uh, the Secretary of State's office, especially over the last eight years, there has been a tremendous improvement uh, in this interconnectivity. There has been a tremendous improvement uh, in the process to start a business. There has been a tremendous improvement in the relationship between those who are entrepreneurs or are trying to start businesses uh, and the office itself. There, there always needs to be improvements, that, that's for sure. But to suggest that the entire system is broken is just not true. And I, and I would push back on that, and I, and I think the current Secretary of State would push back on that. It's not a perfect system, but to suggest that it's broken uh, is just not, it's, it's not a true narrative. I think perfect and broken kind of make it very clear. If it's perfect, then we wouldn't say that it's broken. So it's either a perfect system or it's broken. Thank you. All right, we move on. Topic near and dear to my heart. The Secretary of State regulates lobbying activity in the executive and legislative branches of state government and maintains a website where lobbyists report their efforts. Meanwhile, the Board of Elections, separate from the Secretary of State, tracks campaign donations that may come from lobbyists and others. So, question is, is there enough being done to make sure that lobbying laws and rules are being respected? What can be done to increase the transparency around lobbying? And one small idea I have, which is always there for me being in sales, I want the lanyards to be printed on both sides <laughs> because they flip over all the time. And so people wear them and backwards, you don't know who the person is, you don't know the number. So that would be one thing. But, um, so, I forget where we're just Thank you. Thank you for keeping track, everyone. I've said that before. Thank you. Uh, so I agree. Uh, let's let's get a better quality of language <laughs> uh, and make sure that, that, that they're two sided. Yes. Um, so so yes, uh, we need to be as trans transparent as possible on uh, who is lobbying, who they're lobbying for, uh, who they're donating to, uh, how much they're being paid. Uh, that that should be uh, public knowledge. It should be accessible. Uh, it is accessible. But when people do not follow the reporting requirements, and I was pleased to co-sponsor and vote for the Lobby Reform Act, Act in 2016. When people are not following those laws, then, then, then that needs to be pursued. Uh, I, the Secretary, the current Secretary talks about uh, randomized audits all the time. I, I agree with those randomized audits. I think that builds public confidence. I think we should release the results of those audits to the public so that they know that the Office of the Secretary of State is monitoring these reports, that we are, are uh, engaged in oversight, engaged in supervision, and, and uh, the public should know that we're on the job. Where there are violations, those violations, uh, the, those violators should, should pay the penalties according to law. But let me add this, because this is a chance to talk about uh, campaign finance in, in response. The only way under Citizens United, uh, until, until there's a, a, a reversal of Citizens United, or until uh, there's a constitutional amendment, the only way to combat dark money, huge corporate PAC money, uh, wealthy, wealthy people coming into the electoral space is public matching funds and public financing of elections. It's the only thing that gives an average American the opportunity to compete. It's the only thing. There's no other way to run 
any election really in these, in, in these times without some sort of uh, ability to pay for the messaging. And I, I think in the public financing space, we can do much, much better. Uh, New York City has a great model. It applies to primaries, it applies to generals, it applies to their assembly seat. It's a six to one match. It limits how much can be raised, but it gives those folks who are just average Americans a fighting chance. Someone like me who's a teacher, a current job, I came for my job today. It gives us an opportunity to try to compete at a statewide level that we would not be able to. When you know you see millionaires and billionaires coming into these spaces with, with the ability to buy points in elections. You have huge corporate PACs who are advertising with the ability. The only way to have a fighting chance is through public matching funds that supports our democracy. Okay, I'll give you a little extra time, Ms. Beatty. But um, do, you, do you have the question? You, yeah, I just want to make sure the question is full question. Cool. Um, there is another way. It's called a grassroots campaign, which is what I'm doing. Um, it is also one of those ways where you're not necessarily, you know, reaching out to your buddies who are politicians to kind of sway them or, you know, pay for the outcome of elections that you're more interested in. Uh, when we talk about accessibility, um, I think that the concern here is that the general public doesn't necessarily need to go through and do 13 clicks to be able to find out who's been lobbying and what's been going on. Accessibility means like a big shiny billboard that says that you have been taking money from, you know, a naughty guy, right? Let's be that accessible. Let's be that transparent. No one's gonna advocate for that, right? Politicians don't wanna hear that part. Uh, they wanna tell you that, you know, they worked a regular job and sure they did. And you know, that you, they're just like every one of us. Sure you are, I, I agree with that. But also when it comes to those type of relationships that they build and when you look at the funding that they receive, are they really advocating for the people or are they advocating for folks who have lined their pockets? And so one way is that we look at what amount of money that Mr. Moore has received, what percentage of it is special interest groups and that, you know, heaven forbid, what happens when he enters in that seat? Will he be advocating for you or for the folks who gave $100,000 to support his campaign, right? Or for someone who's running a grassroots campaign, who's not asking your grandmother to, you know, empty out her social securities fund to be able to support our candidate, but to be able to talk to folks and say, if you can donate, that's great. But here's me putting in the effort, knocking on the doors, getting volunteers, getting folks engaged. And that is the process where you can in fact run a campaign. And we don't necessarily need to do these low ball tactics of we're saying millionaires, because there are folks who aren't millionaires that are still doing these um, same behaviors. Right, this, I, I'd like to respond. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. So, so, special interests. Let's talk about who the special interests are that have donated to my campaign. Nurses, teachers, firefighters, frontline workers in grocery stores, CNAs. The special interest PACs that have donated to my campaign are labor unions. Um, that's, that's the everyday person that is contributing their funds to their labor union, their labor union is sending money toward people that value their work. These are the people that make America work. I am proud that they support me. Uh, I'm proud to support them. I don't know how the Secretary of State's office would be influenced by those labor unions. Um, we talked about the jobs that exist under the uh, office. 94% um, of my money comes from Rhode Islanders. Uh, the average contribution is $70. Uh, I, I would say that no one uh, that's running for statewide office can make tho both those claims at the same time. Uh, this is not a wealthy campaign. I'm out knocking on doors. I'm in a grassroots campaign as well. I'm talking to people. Yes, I've built relationships over the course of 10 years. I'm proud of the support I have from my colleagues in government. They, they trust me. Uh, they think I'm somebody that can get the job done. They've seen my legislative record. They know that there's accomplishment there. They, they know that the legislation that I sponsor uh, is is benefiting by and large uh, the quality of life for Rhode Islanders. So I, I don't apologize uh, for accepting uh, special interest money. If the special interest money we're talking about, and it can only be that money, is coming from uh, uh, teachers and nurses and firefighters uh, and frontline food and commercial workers, I, 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 I gladly accept that money. I, I, would, I would say that those <laughs> folks who are first responders, my mom is still a CNA to this day. My sister is actually a pediatrician at MGH. Uh, folks who have been on the front line for COVID can't afford to be financing politicians. 
um, folks who have worked in the union, I was also a member of the union, um, can't afford to be spending that money in that regard. Uh, gas prices are high, money is, it's really high to even buy regular groceries. And so when we say grassroots campaign, the definition of a grassroots campaign is vastly different from what you're describing, but um, we can agree to this. We can. Okay. I'm gonna try to wrestle this back on course a little bit, and we're gonna go back to 90 seconds for questions and responses. I also want to get it back on lobbying because I had a follow up question on lobbying and I think we lost track of that. And I want to, what more needs to be done to make sure that lobbyists are not engaging in such pay to play when they are writing big checks and holding big fundraisers for politicians? What regulations would you advocate for in that regard? And sorry. yes, please repeat the question. I'm sure. sorry. It's about um, lobbyists. Um, what more needs to be done to make sure that lobbyists are not engaging in pay to play when they are writing big checks and holding big fundraisers for politicians? And what regulations would you advocate for to get that kind of under? So I understand the need to advocate for a particular group that's protected under the First Amendment that you have free speech, right? And we want to respect that. Uh, what comes into play here is, as you mentioned, with raising large funds of money, you'd be more than susceptible, I would say, uh, to be influenced in that direction to provide outcome to benefit a particular group uh, that would necessarily marginalize others. Uh, one thing that I would recommend is that we no longer participate in these when we're running for our campaigns, that we would be really neutral in the sense that we are representative of, we are public servants and that we represent that space well. That when we look at the folks who are lining the coffers of our opponents, that that does not necessarily mean that that needs to appeal to our inner flesh, that we can really hone into what our, do, what our responsibility is and what the office entails. And so the Office of Secretary of State, in my opinion, should be completely neutral, regardless of political party, regardless of political affiliation. So you would not want to be a part of that in any respects because you would not want to give any type of impression that you have been influenced, coerced, even if you feel that you haven't been, uh, to a particular group. Thank you, Representative Amore. So I would go back to the uh, public matching funds and a more robust public campaign uh, finance. I, I, I think that is the only way uh, for the average person to compete in this space. And while it's, uh, it's no, uh, notable, uh, noble to, to want this to remain a neutral situation, we're in a democratic primary as part of a political process. Uh, the old saying goes, it's very hard to take politics out of politics. Um, and it's very difficult to run any campaign without the ability to get your message out there. No matter how, how grassroots it is, you can't knock every door across the state. It's, it's really impossible to knock every door across a Senate district effectively and meet people. I will say this, R Rhode Island is the most restrictive uh, of any states when it comes to what you can contribute. Our threshold is $1,000 per year. And I think that's good. Uh, I, I, I think that's right where it should stay. Um, because that, that does not lead to quid pro quo. Uh, I can tell you that there are individuals who have donated to my campaigns in the past who have advocated for things I am adamantly opposed to. Uh, I, I have uh, members of the uh, charter school community uh, who have donated to my campaign. I'm not anti-charter, but I, 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 I wanna work on the funding and finance for that. I have not supported their legislation, but they've donated to my campaign because they think I'm, I'm a, a, a public servant who has integrity and honesty. But I think the only way to, to tackle this is that, is that model that New York is using now, which is a more robust uh, system, and to keep the cap where it is. Thank you. Um, question number nine. The Secretary of State processes, reserves, and gives the public access to hundreds of thousands of historic documents and public records. Um, they also maintain the open meetings portal where the public can find information about all meetings at every level of government except for the General Assembly, which made themselves immune to the Open Meetings Act. When it comes to making government more accessible and transparent, what more can be done? What educational resources can be brought to bear? What can be done to strengthen enforcement of the Open Meetings Act? And I know that the Secretary of State doesn't necessarily enforce the Open Meetings Act, that's the AG, but there is, um, the Open Meetings Portal does give you some authority in that. Yeah, so let's talk about enforcement. I, I actually think that, uh, the model should look like the Board of Elections AG model. So I think the Secretary of State's office should uh, should be keeping track of uh, violations of the open meetings law 
investigating those violations. And then when they see uh, an opportunity where there is uh, evidence that this is a pattern or it's clear, a, clear, uh, a, a clear effort to keep information from the public or violating the public's right, uh, then that should be referred to the Attorney General. Now, as currently situated, the, the Office of the Secretary of State doesn't have the capacity to do that, but I think that's a better model. Um, so, so that's that's one uh, area. Uh, the other the other area would be improving the the website. Uh, it does need improvement. It is not perfect. Um, and what what we see, and and our our uh, colleagues in in uh, city and town government, is that we we go and look at the at the uh, uh, the meeting listed, but then we have to go to two different spaces to find out specifically what's on the agenda. Uh, that that has to improve. That has to improve. Uh, and then finally. Um, uh, I would say we have a, a a real opportunity to use the pandemic as a teacher in that uh, we can have people take part in public meetings and offer comment in public meetings remotely, uh, and that and that should, I don't think that the I don't think that the body the the body itself should be remote unless unless we're in a, a pandemic situation again where it's dangerous. But I do think the public should be able to come in person and they should be able to come remotely and offer testimony. Uh, we saw it work extremely well during the pandemic, and I, I'd be advocating for continuing that. I would go a step further. So um, I agree with a lot of the items that you mentioned, but a step further in the sense that uh, when you go into the open meetings, when you go to look at a meeting that's been posted, a lot of times at the agenda, the meeting minutes aren't even there. Uh, so instead of saying we're looking for habitual offenders, I think that there's clearly a tendency of why this keeps happening uh, over and over. I think that at this point in time, we should be able to kind of find folks. So this is the requirements. Here's the expectation. If you don't meet a set expectation, here's what the, the penalty will be. Continue to meet the expectation on a second time. Here's what the, the uh, penalty will be and enforce it in that space. If we keep giving passes, uh, clearly it hasn't been taken seriously for X number of years, then this behavior kind of continues and we perpetuate the system. We're not really resolving anything when we're just gonna say, we're gonna kick the bucket down, down the line and just give it to the AG's office. I'm sure that they're pro they are probably working on other things, but within our space, we can totally find a way to hold folks accountable, create, uh, we have a problem, Come up with a solution and follow through with an execution of a plan instead of passing the buck to the next department. So let's be clear: the attorney general has this responsibility now, right? It does. The, but the, I'm the Department I'd of like State, to hear I, I, but I, I think the statement that was just made indicates that we're kicking it to the attorney uh, attorney general. The attorney general has this power now. Yeah. I would suggest a bifurcated uh, system where the secretary of state's office does the does the investig investigatory work and points to it. Right now, all the burden is on the attorney general. I just, wanted, I just wanted to clarify. So the Secretary of State could like write a ticket, and then they would have to. That's, that's what I'm talking about. But right now, the, the sole the sole powers with the AG now. Right, right, right. That would be. I think that'd be an interesting. Right. Thing to go. But it um, hasn't been working, so that's what we're trying to fix, right? Yeah. So the AG is supposed to be doing this. They're not doing that. Creating a system where we are finding people, tagging it, following through, kind of the looking for more solution based approaches rather than kind of repeat. There was a problem with like a couple of city councils. Sure. A couple of boards, and, sure. th and this attorney general has has been much better than the last in this <laughs> in this better, space, yes. uh, and better. and I think the Department of State can have a, a role in that. Yep. I too. Um, get towards the end here, so this is great. You guys were doing fantastic. Thank you. Um, incumbent Secretary of State Neil Garbea advocated for the construction of a new state archives to be built across the street from the state house, um, that would properly conserve, preserve, and display our state's historic documents. Sadly, the General Assembly never approved this project. Is this something you would advocate? And remember whose turn it is? Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Beach. Uh, I would advocate for that. I think that it's really important that we preserve our history, that folks uh, have the opportunity to see the immense uh, stories of Rhode Island, of our Native Americans, of our, you know, basketball teams, our little leagues, to be able to tell that story in a space that they can all come and visit. Uh, another thing that I think that we can do best is also use technology in a space that it's easily accessible to be able to get that. So if you can't even be able to be in person, that you can be able to have that information readily accessible for you to be able to disseminate at your, le at your leisure. Um, I, I believe that the General Assembly 
has okayed for this to move forward, but I'm not sure. These are the conversations that I've heard. So th this is the whisper, I should say, that the gossip. My knowledge that hasn't been passed. Yes. Okay, the, the gossip in the room. Um, my understanding is that using an old, I would love for it to be in an older building. I think that preserves history. I'm a big fan of that. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of history and I like to preserve things for the way that they are and to be able to hold, host it in an older building, I think would talk, speak to the richness of Rhode Island. Um, I also understand that from a budget perspective that a newer building was something that was considered more cost effective. And so I would like to be able to look at the budget reassess and to see what is the best way that we can kind of be able to deliver on that promise to folks that I think would be um, a cultural high, highlight for Rhode Island. Senator Memorial. Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Uh, I supported it when the Secretary of State uh, proposed it. It would require a statewide bond, uh, e either for a new building or to rehab and, and make appropriate a new one. Look, I think it can be an economic driver, um, a tourist uh, driver. Uh, we are one of the original 13 uh, colonies and one of the original 13 states. Uh, we see all around the country where people go to Philadelphia, where they go to Washington, D.C., where they go to New York, uh, and they are focused in on historical tourist, and that's what this would provide. We have a, a plethora of uh, documents. Uh, and, and I've been fortunate as a history teacher in Rhode Island to be able to access the archives and to use the archives and the, uh, and the resources that the office has provided and, the, and that the archives has provided in my class. And so I, I know what a, a tremendous uh, space that is. Look, I've been talking about civic engagement for a long time. This is a piece of that, for, for sure. Um, I, I want to create a liaison system uh, with every high school in Rhode Island and every college in Rhode Island where there's a faculty and staff member and a student who is a liaison to the department, both in the area of voter registration and in the area of curriculum uh, and using the archives to benefit uh, those institutions and our communities at large. I think this is a really important space uh, right now, considering the uh, assault uh, on democracy around the country, considering uh, the, the uh, conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories uh, that are existing about our elections, about our democracy. It's really, civic education is really important. I talked to you before about uh, my, my authorship of the Civic Literacy Act. I think that's, that's, a, that's an essential piece of legislation that I'm proud of. Okay. Um, before we move on to final statements, I just want to say something about the um, archives. Right now, the um, earliest videos we have of the General Assembly they first started videotaping, they're all on beta, stored in boxes, and we don't have a beta player in the state. The state doesn't own a beta player, so if you want to access these old videos, you can't watch them. And it would really be a worthwhile project, I think, to digitize those, get them up on the web or anywhere. Just a thought, throwing that out there since I have you here. Uh -huh. I, I, I remember one people. of my homeworks, I had to use microfilm, uh, yeah. and that was really cool. That's what I'm saying, so, so yeah. we can get, we can do <laughs> better on this, and that would be fun. Um, I tried to look at some of these old tapes, you can't look at them. So anyway, closing statements, and I think we're going to you, Representative Amore. Thank you, and again, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think it was a, a fantastic discussion. I appreciate Stephanie's uh, input. I, I appreciate everybody being here. Um, look, I, I, you know, for, for better or worse, and I, I'd like to think better, uh, I'm a known commodity. Uh, I've been a public servant uh, officially for 10 years. Um, I have, I have uh, served my community uh, with what I believe is integrity and honesty. Uh, I have operated in a space uh, where I'm, I'm trying to improve the lives of Rhode Islanders, whether that be legislation that deals with coverage for chemotherapy, whether that be legislation that deals with a chronic illness, whether that be legislation that deals with uh, expanding insurance coverage, uh, whether it be legislation that reforms uh, some of the things we do in education, uh, whether it be instituting the ELL categorical so that we have funding for English language learners did not exist before I became the chairman of the Education Subcommittee on Finance. Uh, these are things that I've worked on that I'm passionate about uh, in the public policy space. Um, I believe because of my background uh, in public education, specifically in history, because I've managed a large system in the East Providence school system with the athletic department, and because I'm uh, familiar with how to navigate state government, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a good choice for this seat, and I would appreciate uh, your consideration on or before September 13th. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Judy, the final word goes to you. Um, I graduated from Gilbert Stewart. I went to Hope High School, which is down the road. Uh, I am a local person here. My daughter goes to Festival Ballet, and we go across to get a, 
a chocolate croissant after she does a good do a good job at pre-k which means she sat down she focused and she got her work done um why i'm running for secretary of state i think i've answered why i would be a better candidate is that we need someone who's neutral someone who truly understands how to get the job done if there was someone more qualified i promise you i would not be here I have unlimited vacation right now, and I've enjoyed that for a number of years. I am walking away from the luxuries and the amenities that I have because I see that there is a problem and this wheel keeps turning and it is getting really old. It has gotten very boring and it's getting very tiring really, really fast. Tax paying funding has been wasted. When we talk about legislations that we've drafted, that's all good and well to a certain extent where folks are still talking about the same problems at the polling station that existed 10 years ago to today. Besides COVID, that's not even the point. We won't even get down that road. When we talk about small businesses, they were talking about struggling before COVID. So we won't even get to today. So that's besides the point. So we have someone that's been doing politics for a very long time. And we have seen what that has gotten us. Nowhere. We get the same career politicians that get promoted up and up through the ranking. And here is the time that we stop that now. We have an opportunity to literally make a civic to, to use our civic duty and exercise and make our own judgment, not what your paid advertisers told you, not what someone else paid for someone to tell you on national television, for you to make an informed decision to look at what is at stake here. It is the next election cycle. That is what is at stake. We want to make sure that we are no longer having polarizing elections. We want to make sure that it's fair, fast, and accurate for everybody not for some people, that no one gets left out. And we wanna also make sure that small businesses succeed today. The time is now and change happens when regular people decide to, to pull up, up their I'm bootstraps sorry. and come today. 90 seconds, I'm sorry, don't mean this. No um, thank you very much, that was great. Uh, you can applaud now if you like. And I've been asked to remind everybody that on Thursday, September 1st, right here in this room, we're going to be having a mayoral Debate for Providence, Gonzalo Cuervo, Nervola Fortune, Brett Smiley, run by the Community Libraries of Providence and the League of Women Voters. So that should be very interesting. I was glad the first one, it was some different questions. So it might be worth showing up. Thank you everybody. And thank you to those at home.